Uh, we're going to talk today about the Perry case, the case out of California, uh, which involves a challenge to a restriction on same-sex marriage. Right. But Perry is a kind of unusual case in terms of the, the factual background and the posture that it's coming to the Supreme Court. Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, the broad question in Perry, as it's before the Supreme Court, is whether the Equal Protection Clause bars a state from declaring that uh, marriage is a union between a man and a woman. But uh, by way of, of background, uh, there was a California Supreme Court decision some years back, I think it was 2008, which held that it violated the California Constitution for marriage to be limited to a man and a woman. In other words, same-sex marriage under the California Constitution uh, was constitutionally required. As a result of that, shortly thereafter, Proposition 8, which was an initiative under California law, began to get going. And what that uh, declared, and it was ultimately passed, was what I was saying earlier, and that is that marriage uh, under the California Constitution now, as declared by Proposition 8, uh, is a union between a man and a woman. So, so there was a period of time in California uh, when same-sex marriage was legal uh, right. under the California Constitution. Correct. And the voters of California voted to change that, uh, to change the Constitution, and to say that marriage was only between a man and a woman. And therefore, the challenge is now not on state constitutional grounds, but it's on federal constitutional grounds, the Equal Protection Clause in particular. So the Ninth Circuit, which is the Federal Court of Appeals that uh, decided this case most recently, held that the California ban on same-sex marriage is unconstitutional, but it, it ruled on pretty narrow grounds, didn't it? Uh, very narrow grounds. It ruled on grounds that really came from a Supreme Court decision of some years back called Romer versus uh, Evans. Uh, in, in in Romer versus Evans, the Supreme Court held that a California, that a Colorado constitutional uh, amendment, if you will, which uh, disadvantaged homosexuals violated the Equal Protection Clause because it was, in the court's view, in Romer v. Evans, premised on, grounded on animus towards homosexual, homosexuals. And the Ninth Circuit in this case used the Romer reasoning and said that uh, declaring that marriage is, under Proposition uh, 8, that declaring that marriage was uh, limited to a union between a man and a woman reflected a kind of insult to the dignity of homosexuals, and therefore it violated the Equal Protection Clause under the reasoning of Romer. But it was it violated the dignity of, of homosexuals for very specific, California-specific reasons. Exactly correct. Which are what? In this case, uh, civil unions, domestic partnerships, have all of the same benefits uh, as marriage. The only difference is that Proposition 8 made, the only difference was to take the name marriage away from uh, civil unions between same-sex couples. And that makes it a bit of a harder decision than the Romer v. Evans case was. In fact, the dissenting judge uh, in the Ninth Circuit made precisely that point, among others. So do you think it's possible that the Supreme Court would uphold the Ninth Circuit decision in a way that doesn't extend same-sex marriage to states other than California? Uh, it is very possible that the court could, could do that. The court, if it wanted, could even go beyond and uh, uh, articulate a certain level of what we call equal protection scrutiny. Uh, in the Ninth Circuit, the court used what's called actual purpose rational basis review. And the Supreme Court could go with that and apply it here and uphold the Ninth Circuit. It could, to the contrary, it could say, no, uh, this doesn't violate uh, actual purpose, rational basis review, and would then perhaps have to reach questions about the level of scrutiny under the Equal Protection Clause. Intermediate level scrutiny, which imposes a greater burden on government, and strict scrutiny, which is not likely that the court's going to use, which imposes the greatest burden on government uh, in equal protection cases altogether. And, and when you say greater burden on government, you mean to justify whatever to, the law is that's being challenged. Exactly right, because in, uh, in the Perry case, uh, the government was justifying this uh, Proposition 8 on several grounds. I actually shouldn't say the government was doing it, because the government 
the executive branch chose not to fight uh, to defend Proposition 8. But those who were behind the initiative uh, were arguing that this encouraged uh, uh, responsible procreation and childbearing, uh, child rearing, uh, as well as uh, desire to go uh, proceed with caution in terms of uh, defining marriage. And the Ninth Circuit, as I said, uh, said that these were not rationally related uh, to Proposition 8. Because Proposition 8, remember, involved the withdrawal of certain, of certain benefit, the name of marriage, the withdrawal of that from same-sex couples. But nothing else. But nothing else, exactly. So the Supreme Court could say that marriage between same-sex couples is, in fact, constitutionally protected. And that would require all states to recognize same-sex marriage. It could do that. I'd be surprised if it did. Uh, that really goes beyond the equal protection discussion that we're having, because one of the arguments in many of these cases uh, is that marriage is a fundamental right. And when we say fundamental right, we mean a fundamental federal constitutional right. Um, the Ninth Circuit in the Perry case itself went out of its way to say we're not talking about that at all. Again, it wanted to reach the decision on the narrowest possible ground uh, uh, in striking down Proposition 8. Uh, one of the problems with the fundamental rights argument is that according to Supreme Court jurisprudence of, of, of decades, long-standing jurisprudence, uh, you rely on tradition. I don't think it's plausible to argue that there is a long-standing tradition of, um, of marriage uh, for same-sex couples. So that might be why uh, that's why it's unlikely that the Supreme Court would go that route, but you never, you never know. It depends a little bit on the level of generality that the Supreme Court talks about the fundamental Precisely right. Precisely correct. Uh, if you go beyond a narrow view of tradition, then you might argue about the fundamentally, uh, fundamentality of marriage uh, in relationships and for the society as a whole. So is there, without talking about marriage as a fundamental right, there's a, the Supreme Court could also say that uh, because uh, homosexuals are a, sort of a, a discrete group of people, that they're going to impose some higher level of scrutiny and for, on that basis outlaw restrictions on same-sex marriage. It could do that. As you may remember from a few moments ago, we talked about rational basis, actual purpose review, but there is a uh, that higher standard uh, intermediate level scrutiny, which in fact the companion case, the Windsor case, which is not the subject of our discussion today, uh, the court in that case, the Second Circuit, used intermediate level scrutiny uh, for sexual orientation discrimination and benefits uh, under federal, uh, st federal tax law. Uh, so it's possible the court would do that. And of course, I've been saying that the Supreme Court could say that restrictions on same-sex marriage are unconstitutional, but it could say the opposite. If it reaches these questions, the Supreme Court could say states are free to outlaw same-sex marriage if they choose. I think that is uh, correct. It's very tricky here, uh, particularly because uh, uh, a decision upholding, uh, affirming the Ninth Circuit could keep states out of the business all Together, it would keep states that want to con seriously consider uh, same-sex marriage from doing it because they would be told, possibly by a decision in this case by the Supreme Court, that once they go that route, they could never change their minds. And then, in fact, that's one of the arguments that's made uh, by the proponents of uh, Proposition 8 in the Supreme Court. So that would at least discourage some states from experimenting. It could, it precisely. That could be the result.